Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Thanks for joining. So for those of you who just joined, welcome. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Okay, we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight. My name is Jenna. I'm the programs manager at Center for Book Arts. Tonight, we'll be hearing from the 2019 artists in residence who took part in the scholarship for advanced studies in the book arts. And they're also some of the artists that are featured in our current exhibition, New Book Art. The exhibition is currently installed in our external galleries, and it also includes work from the 2019 Workspace Residence. Our 2019 scholars had the exclusive opportunity to have year-long access to our studio spaces, unlimited tuition waiver for our courses, and were given stipends to create new work. Since their residency, they've each produced projects that incorporate the skills and practice as advanced book artists, as well as the techniques they learned during their time at Center for Book Arts. We'll hear from Slavko Jurek, Keith Graham, Jennifer Grimeiser, and Christina Martinelli, who will be discussing their work, followed by an audience Q&A. 
Support, support for programs like these are provided in part by the New York City, the New York State Council on the Arts with support of Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and by public funds from New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. Before we begin the program, I'd like to remind everyone to keep their microphones off and use the chat to share any responses or questions throughout the event. We also encourage you to visit the show currently at Center for Book Arts. You can reserve a time slot by visiting centerforbookarts.org slash exhibitions. We have closed captioning available. You can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Slavko Jurek. Hi, Jenna. Uh, hope you guys can hear me. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to uh, show you some, to talk to you and to show you some of my work that I produced uh, during the residency at the Center for Book Arts in 2018 and to show you a little bit more than just that. Uh, before I start, I would really like to express my deepest gratitude to the whole team of uh, Center, for, Center for Book Arts, to Corina and Jenna and Zoe, Kelsey, um, and many others uh, that also, besides them, I would really like to thank the whole community uh, of artists and instructors that I met at the Center for Book Arts and all of the work, the work that I produced at the Center for Book Arts wouldn't be possible without encountering any of you guys. So thank you, honestly, thank you. Um, I will just uh, begin uh, uh, with, a, with a few biographical notes. Um, and I'll be, I'll be very short. Uh, I was born in Yugoslavia in 1979, so around the time when Richard Minsky actually started uh, Center for Book Arts. I was born and raised there, and um, I moved to New York when I was around the age of 25 or 26. So uh, after graduating high school over there with a degree in natural science, I had decided to totally switch gears and to, to move on to the fine arts. And many of my high school professors who were very serious people uh, disliked that idea and wouldn't say hi to me <laughs> when they would see me on the street. Um, but I, I'm, ex uh, I'm pointing out in my, in my high school degree uh, because uh, that because of all, all the turmoil in that area of Yugoslavia and economic crisis uh, uh, made my studying of printmaking very difficult. As, we, as you, some of you might know, um, printmaking relies a lot on specific art supplies uh, or chemi chemicals, uh, which uh, were very hard to, to get a hand of and um, being, uh, Having a, having a background in, in natural science helped a lot uh, um, overcoming those issues. And I think that really made me who I am as an artist and as a person, always trying to be resourceful for myself and for others and somewhat inventive, if I, if I may say so. So, uh, if you give me a second, I will start sharing my screen and I will start my presentation uh, of the work I'd like to show you tonight. Um, I will start with showing you a couple of photographs of journals. Uh, journals played a very important role in my life, um, both as an artist and personally. Uh, they are the earliest record of, uh, of the relationship I have with books and, and in art, uh, with, uh, with art in general. Um, journaling is also um, my daily practice and uh, part of the, my mental hygiene. And um, that's also a place where 
a lot of my ideas do get uh, materialized for a very first time. Slavko, uh, sorry to interrupt, but your screen um, is not showing the image. So can you try resharing with a desktop view? All right, just give me a second. Um, right, okay, give me a second, please. Mm -hmm. Can you see the image now? Yes. All right. So as I said, uh, what, I've been, what I'll be showing you in a couple of photographs are actually uh, various <clears throat> uh, journals that I made for myself uh, at the, during the residency at, uh, at the Center for Book Arts. Um, so whenever I had a chance to uh, Ex exercise a new structure, a new book format that I learned over there, uh, or I just simply had like a stack of paper that I uh, wanted to use, uh, no matter what size, I did actually make myself a journal or I made a book for someone else. And uh, here's another photograph of, of, again, like just a stack of like different books that I, that I made and they were just simply very personal. And that I think there is a crucial aspect in them why I'm also showing them at the very beginning because I do have like a two, two decades at least long relationship with, with keeping the journals, keeping journals and that might have informed all my uh, book practice uh, being somewhat uh, intimate, uh, predominantly in intimate. Um, as the as next uh, image, uh, I'm, I'll be showing you um, an example of uh, some of my printmaking work, uh, which is how I came, how my path took me to the to the uh, book arts. <clears throat> as being as very curious as a person, uh, also printmaking. Uh, wasn't any difference. It, like the medium itself brought me to the, its own outskirts uh, of, of itself. And I started exploring different possibilities than just editioning um, the, the prints. So I started making a large series of monoprints, including like, like, like this one. And I just had a feeling that there was so many images inside of the plate inside the carved woodblock that just by changing the approach to it, I could uh, bring out to life. So in this case, there is this lithograph called uh, uh, Whistling Moon Traveler, and uh, it's named after Firecracker, by the way. And uh, after printing the whole edition, I, I, I went into a whole another uh, reprinting process and then collaging and painting over uh, but by creating such a body of work of sometimes hundreds of unbound images, uh, all having the same root, but at the same time, each one diverging from the original, um, my attention was brought to the flow between these prints. And I think that was uh, an actual breaking point where I was uh, start actively thinking about, about the book format. In the next photograph, there is actually a, a sample of, of what I've been trying to, to explain. Uh, that whole, whole series of, of lino cuts printed in very different ways was bound into one object. Um, it represents uh, <laughs> like an emerging artist and, and, and then bounding them all together, it creates this whole army of, 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 of the same uh, feeling being, uh, the same feeling that we all as an emerging artist do have at some time. And pretty much is, it comes down to anxiety. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, there's more pictures uh, of, of it. In around 2015, I, I uh, had experienced like another um, <clears throat> uh, uh, type of work and I started making this uh, woven prints 
and also some, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later, double bound books. But in this case, what you're looking at, uh, this is uh, four photographs representing a same copy from that series. So what you're seeing in the first photograph is basically the very same, just with a different layout of the, of the elements of that print. And um, around that time, I started thinking more about inner workings of the, of the imagery uh, rather than the surface value of it. Uh, and that moment, that year, this type of work did open up like a whole new set of questions uh, to, my, uh, to me as an artist and answer, answers are definitely were waiting for me in hard work and below the surface. So I decided to, to dive in. Um, there is another uh, uh, sample example of, of the same type of work. Uh, as you can see, it may be on the screen. This series is called Noble Savage. And uh, we're all again seeing the two images of the same print but just again laid out in a different way. And uh, following images, again from the same series with just some additional uh, process shots over here. By the way, this is my home studio and I'm still talking, speaking to you from there. So nothing got burned down. Everything was under the control. Um, but if all of these things seems to be a little bit kind of confusing, I have this video uh, of how these interchangeable reliefs actually work. So hopefully it will all work well. It's a stop motion video. So as you can see, there are two spines, two prints are juxtaposed and, and woven together. And, and they can they can change right within themselves. So uh, in a sense, each of these paper objects becomes a, a source of, I'll, I'll, I'll say innumerable uh, amount of images. So then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, was all, I also started working with a double bound books. Um, uh, this book is called Psychographics. Uh, it is a reference to the, growing uh, surveillance program and uh, kind of like this, not kind of a very discrim discriminatory uh, artificial intelligence behind it. Um, as you can see, th this book is uh, bound with uh, metal rings on a side, on a both sides, the left and right. This is how it looks like when it's open. Um, it is a book of portraits, as you can see, uh, which I made as original. They were made uh, as pen and ink drawings, and I made uh, addition of three by using screen printing uh, technique. Uh, so these are the projects that brought me to the residency at Center for Book Arts, and I will show you a few things now that I actually made at the at the residency. Uh, this is a project called Abs Ab Absurdance. Um, it's the first project that I made at the Center for Book Arts, and it is a limited edition of 12 of, of modular boxes. By modular, I mean that the lid, once it's opened up and once it reveals this uh, cutout of a dog chasing its own tail, uh, it can become a pedestal uh, to it and like making this thing into the kind of like a monument. Um, uh, this dog is a reference to the uh, Asian Greek, uh, Asian Greek uh, school of uh, cynics. And if you're familiar with the Diogenes, he was also known as the dog. And, uh, and this is homage to him to some extent. Uh, second project I'd like to show you tonight is uh, called Homeland Insecurity. Um, after taking uh, uh, Maria Pisano's uh, uh, class on, on carousel books, 
I was inspired to repeat it and to learn this technique. And uh, in this case, I've made uh, a set of 10 books. They are actually uh, united into one body of work. Um, <clears throat> uh, this book, as by its title, is totally okay if it gets judged by the cover and by the title because it, it is obviously a reference to the mistreatment of, of immigrants, not just here, but rather all around the world. And being one of them, uh, as I said, mentioned at the beginning, I'm from, I was born in Yugoslavia. Uh, I know that a lot of, for a, for a long time to immigrants, home is uh, rather, rather an idea of a shelter. And for a very long time, even to, to me, the, it was built by nothing but memories and, and dreams and hopes. So this is uh, the photograph of the, when I first installed this object, this uh, project at home, and this was during the lockdown. I, I'm holding my head, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> and as you can see, they're, they're sitting on the shelf and the, the whole project is quite big, um, around like 10 feet long. And, uh, and I, I, I enjoyed it for a while having it at home. Now it's taken down and um, there's more, uh, there's other projects to, to, <laughs> to put up and be proud of. Um, this project is uh, called Of What Is. Uh, this was a chat book. Uh, project uh, produced for the one of my favorite events uh, at the Center for Book Arts. Uh, it's called Poetry Reading Series. And my dear friend, the friend Ronnie Gross invited me to collaborate with her on uh, producing 100 copies of, of, of this book for Edwin Torres's poem. And after we failed so many times attempt, you know, like attempting to, 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 to design this book, um, the, the design kind of settled down on its own between these like colorful pages and let this poem speak for itself. And we just kind of created this colorful, broken, colorful but broken space for his poem. And me and Ronnie are still friends which is great, which is a proof that this thing all worked out. And this is a photograph of, uh, of Edwin Torres signing all those copies. And he was very excited about our, our design and our, about our books. Uh, as uh, I believe it's last project that I will be showing you tonight, one before the last, uh, this is the project that I am um, most proud of. Uh, it did take me a very long time to to put all the elements together and uh, it did take a whole village to make this thing so again i'm very thankful to everyone at the center for book arts all the people that i spent so many hours over there and asking all these questions that actually helped me realize this project so this project is called interdependence and it was designed as an installation of, of 12 gregarious and mutually dependent, uh, dependent books. The focus for this in this project was uh, um, shifted from introspective nature of, of, of artist books and uh, more focused on synaptic connectivity between the books. Uh, what I'm trying, what I try to achieve with this book uh, with this series of book and with the installation is to show how all uh, connected we are. And uh, books are to some extent unreadable, unreadable uh, if you're one-on-one -on -one of them or if there's like a single copy only in the, in the, in the situation when they're like just, they're, they're superimposed, they recreate the content. As you can see, this is the, in, this is the space, negative space of the book in between where the positive space happens. Uh, and here is a couple of photographs of the installation. 
uh, at, at the, in the current show at the Center for Book Lighting, if, if you didn't have a chance to see it. Um, the, I have this video to show you and I will be uh, done very soon here. Uh, as, as the last thing that I'd like to show you guys is uh, something that I experienced um, only because I was at the Center for Book Arts. And I'm going to share you, with you a few of the installation shots of various book projects that I have. Um, and as I lay them out in this empty gallery space, uh, I realized how connected, connected they were and uh, they formed a somewhat a, a network among them. I really enjoyed seeing their inner dynamic. And uh, to me personally, it did kind of replicate uh, 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 a, a pleasant labyrinth that I think I've been living in and which I, to some extent, like call home. Uh, swirl of ideas and thoughts and desires to, to accomplish so much. And so, yeah, these are the, the shots from, from the gallery. This is the a variety of the same books like uh, that I put up on, the, on my wall during the lockdown. And I will finish uh, with a few sketches for the future installations I'm thinking about. And these are the drawings from some one of the recent journals. So, stop sharing. Yes. So, that was me. Thank you so much. And, and I will pass the microphone to Keith. Graham. Thank you very much, Lovka. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. I would like to Echo Slavko's thanks to everyone, uh, Karina, Jenna, everyone at Center for Book Arts, the community, and the instructors as well. Uh, and without further ado, let me jump into this. Uh, I'm going to open up a slideshow. Which will hopefully be appearing on your screens. Here we are. And I'll uh, flip through this as I read. Uh, so my practice as an artist is based on a process of observation, image collecting, and representation using drawing, photography, and hand printing processes to build the world as I see it. I find material in chance encounters with natural and man made places, people doing things and in looking closely at inconsequential and often overlooked images and objects. Uh, as an aside, I grew up on, one of, on the edge of one of the largest industrial areas on the West Coast uh, in South Seattle. And it took me many years to realize that the sprawling areas that I wandered through in my teenage years um, really reflected in places I respond to most in New York. Um, kind of industrial, post-industrial spaces, um, places which can seem out of human scale, but reflect our industrial history and yeah, the things we do and, and the way we treat each other. Uh, so increasingly, I've been fascinated as well by pattern and typographic design, especially in the ways that meaning can be contained in abstraction. Collaboration is also an important part of my practice. Um, and in the pieces I have up now at the Center for Book Arts, um, 
I've highlighted some recent collaborative projects. Uh, so I'd like to read the exhibition text that accompanies my current show at CBA. So the pieces selected for this exhibition represent recent collaborations with other artists or with writers' poems. Actually, let me skip ahead to some of those actual images. At the bottom, here we are. A uh, common theme I find in them is the subjectivity of lived experience. Collaboration has given me an opportunity to experiment with relationships between image and text and to interact with creative voices distinct from my own. Uh, Dimness was an extended collaboration with Virginia-based artist Dean Das. The starting point was a discussion about evolving standards of beauty and Japanese aesthetics, which at times prized the appearance of tarnished, worn, and humble objects. Uh, the pages were added to successfully using a range of print media, mailed back and forth at irregular intervals. Uh, Cuadernos del Dolor was a project I had the privilege of designing and printing for Argentine artist Catalina Chervin. Don't think I have an image of that handy. Uh, the small zine represents a, a series of drawings relating to life under military rule following the 1976 uh, Argentine coup d'etat. Poem to be read from right to left, names Cassandra and Sky were printed for the Center for Book Arts Broadside Reading Series. The Other World was produced for the Center's annual poetry chapbook competition uh, in 2019, I believe. Each of these undertakings has allowed me to make considered typographic choices to take on the role of a designer and to see the world through another's eyes. I'll um, continue to the earlier part of my slideshow. It's a bit randomly ordered, but um, shows some of the diversity of what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, but I wanted to say while going through this, that uh, craft is another critical component of my practice. As an undergraduate art student learning stone lithography, I or me and my friends came across the lines in uh, the Tamarind Book of Lithography, which has stuck with me for, for many years at this point. Uh, there is no merit, aesthetic or otherwise, in doing things the hard way. And of course, for some of us, that simply is not true. Um, say craft is uh, really highlighted in spaces like Center for Book Arts and allows for extending the arena of art making to include really direct involvement with materials uh, and processes, uh, which can be really liberating. I've always felt the work of the hand is deeply connected to the work of the mind. So I'm going to flip through just a few more in images and then uh, switch to my phone and go to some books here in my studio. Uh, so you can see me flipping through them live. Uh, we're actually looking at some very large sketchbook pages. These are about uh, opened up maybe over two feet across a foot and a half high, um, kind of an undertaking to carry these sketchbooks around town, but um, it's really satisfying to work so large. Uh, one of the series of large drawings I've been doing recently. A photo of collected pigments used for making inks and paint. Here's a chart. Uh, this was actually from the Center for Book Arts workshop on uh, working directly with pigments. And thinking back on some of the many classes and workshops I took during the residency, uh, a few of them have really stuck with me. Um, gilding and stamping in leather with Uriel Sidor, 
uh, Binding in Leather with Celine Lombardi and working with a uh, full color process letterpress printing with Liz Castaldo. So let me now exit screen sharing. And go to some books. Uh, so this book predates my residency at Center for Book Arts. Um, it's another very large book. You can see my hand, give you a sense of the scale. This book is all silkscreen. It's produced in a small edition. Title is Axis Mundi and was made thinking about uh, the sort of highway strip in the town where I was attending graduate school as the kind of celestial axis of the universe. So for me, this was an early experiment with pattern, overlaying grids over everything. A couple of years ago, seeing the Jack Whitten show uh, at the Met, he referenced grids as a kind of universal extension of, I guess, a human imposition of order onto the world. That gives you a sense of this one. Another book produced during the residency. The title is Timur Mortis Conturbat Me. Uh, in which I present an old poem by William Dunbar titled Lament for the Makers. Alternating with uh, actually cell phone photos taken around New York City and superimposed, expanded, distorted, but mostly overlaid. And uh, this was produced in a, what's a large edition for me, about 30 copies. And printed using plastic plate lithography and silkscreen. Zoom in there. And one final book I'd like to show you. It's a small accordion book made with uh, photos of some friends and coworkers, made while thinking about I guess, the part of my 20s I spent living in New York. This is actually double-sided up from the back as well. It's printed something like a children's book on very thick paper. It's able to stand on its own. Actually opens up to be rather wide. So oh, thanks everyone for hearing me out. Uh, I'd like to pass the mic now to Jennifer. Thank you, Keith. Um, everyone hear me okay? Um, my name is Jennifer Gramantic. Let me share my screen as well. Okay. So during the residency, I pretty much solely focused on the print shop. So I was using the Vander Cook Press to make letterpress prints. I took 
most of my classes also in the print shop. Um, so that was my main focus. And I decided uh, right off the bat that I was gonna um, create a series of letterpress prints um, that would become a final book. So I essentially worked on one project for the majority of the residency. Um, and it ended up being uh, 15 prints. They're each 11, 14 by 11. It ended up being an edition of 35 with a soft cover folio. So I'm just gonna show you a few of the prints that were in that book. Um, this book uh, explored wordplay. It's all text and it encompasses um, some concrete poetry, imagery made of text. Um, it's incorporating satire and humor and then other literary techniques like repetition and alliteration. This is a good example. Um, here I'm using the idiom train of thought and talking about it in terms of memory loss. So steadily losing your train of thought you know, a succession of connected ideas. And then with every repetition of the phrase and descending line, um, a letter is taken away until it slowly and consistently disappears to nothing at the end, bottom of the page. Okay, um, I'll, I'll read these to you just so in case you're, anyone has having like trouble seeing the full page, but this text says from left to right, top to bottom, more often than not, it is really a matter of the whole and not the individual parts. And um, the key is that every single word in this phrase is misspelled. Um, so I was reading this study about um, fluency and rapid reading, and um, it concluded that um, in terms of comprehension, spelling is totally irrelevant to being able to rapidly understand something. And as someone who's very bad at spelling, I found this study a little relieving. And uh, so I put that phrase to the test, um, creating a form with the text in each corner, this sort of rectangular like shape um, to illustrate that um, idea. This is another piece. I was sort of really fascinated with the word deer. It's um, a common greeting, which has really strong duality. It uh, addresses, um, it's meant to address like a total stranger. It's a conventional, very formal salutation. And then on the flip side of that, it is used for someone you cherish, a below, you know, a loved one, um, as a form of you know great affection. So I use different typefaces at the center. Um, it, it doesn't repeat, and um, just to show the diversity of that word. Um, and I just want to say my time at the residency was. A lot of it was just setting type, going through the drawers at the center, which was just like very therapeutic. It was, you know, looking back, my fondest memories was just like spending time setting type. Um, and the center has such like a, a vast array um, available to their artists and all the time you need, all the space you need. I was taking up many, many drawers at one time. Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, so it was just a great residency for that. Um, here, never, 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 never end. And then the word end is actually cut off. So sort of this directional type, um, the text is actually in like a losing battle because the sentence does end there. It is ceaseless, you know, attempting to be ceaseless, but fails, um, the border wins. So I tried with this book to not repeat a typeface or, a, you know, not to use the same size. So there's a lot of variety here of, of type. I used wood type which the center has a good amount of, and it's, it's really exciting to see um, metal type, obviously, and um, just consistent black lettering. Um, here is the phrase yes and no. So I used um, concrete poetry or visual poetry where the arrangement of the letters sort of enhance the meaning, but here it's enhancing a contradictory meaning. meaning. So the word no is spelled out in yeses, and the word yes is spelled out in nos. Um, so the opposite is presented. And then I continued that theme with this phrase, I see you. So text addressing the viewer about, you know, visually being present. But then when you get close, it has this macro, micro read where the word I is spelled out in the letter I, C is spelled out in the letter C and U in the letter U. Um, here's an, I'm just gonna kind of keep going through. Um, here I worked with demonstratives, this, that, these, and those. So sort of like the vagueness of these phrases, um, it could be singular, plural, past, present, um, a thing or an idea, but it's just, all of it is just a touch, a trace. 
Um, I'll zoom in on this one. It says mark, letter, word, sentence, paragraph, and page. So I was interested in like the development of reading and language. And um, this sort of illustrates that evolution with the text growing in size and becoming more dominant. Um, and at this time I was um, under, you know, like learned that I was gonna be a future mother. So I was toward, sort of thinking about the epic job of um, teaching another human language and what a big you know undertaking that seemed. So Mark is the first instance of language and then the page being referencing the book or a complete idea. And then I started to explore the idea of time. This will only take a moment of your time with stagger text, like different spacing. And then time again was used in this one, highlighting um, you know variations, but then more concrete ideas. Yesterday, today being sort of concrete and then every day, someday, any day being, um, you know, just like vague in their understand or explanation. Um, so that was, those, that's what I made at, during the residency time. Post-residency, I started to work um, more from home and began hand stamping, um, cutting stamps from uh, foam or actually rub rubber sheets. Um, so I made the rest of the books I've made at home post-residency. They're all five and a half, no, seven and a half by five and a half, like anywhere from nine to 12 pages, um, addition of 30. Um, so this one's called Failed High Fives. And I'm taking the hand gesture of a high five where two people like simultaneously connect in some sort of celebration or congratulations, congratulatory gesture, but every pair fails at that. Um, so they just can't connect. And in that um, attempt, they also become you know, like kind of humorous puppet like they take on different characters, they become sort of figures. So there's sort of, you know, humorous tone to it as the book progresses, you know, absurdity comes in. And then this is the next book I made. It's called Right About Here. I'll read you some of the pages because some of the text is a bit small. But um, this book address, addresses the act of reading and the concept of the, the book itself and the general structure of books. So here on the first page, it says title here, name here, sort of instructional, um, loosely hold here, here, turn. So it's, it's discussing the formatting a book, handling instructions, a little here, a lot here, here, here. So um, also placement and timing and concentration. This page it says focus intently and then there's like 20 here's. Um, pause approximately here. Don't end here, continue. And then sort of a lot more repetition. And then of course it ends with here goes. Um, this book, no, not, nope, never, nothing. So I think being a New Yorker, um, you're just inundated with signage everywhere you go. It's kind of hard to avoid. Um, and a lot of the signs are prohibition signs, no smoking, no eating, uh, no parking. So I was sort of taking that theme, that, that theme in design, um, sort of these rectangular signs with X's or you know, crosses through them and incorporating um, signature phrases or like common phrases that are used in everyday speech. So no pressure, no pressure, um, all or nothing. Sort of these colloquial phrases or sarcastic remarks. Um, so that diptych between humor and you know authority. So you'll just kind of flip through some of these. Here goes nothing, up to no good. So all the, the nothings are stamped. So I hand cut those. They're all different, again, different typefaces and different styles. You know, I was just really drawn to common, these common phrases, make no mistake, no joke. So sort of piggyback on that idea of signage, I made this book called By Now, which instead of prohibition signs, it was sale signs for retail for the you know display of commercial goods. So um, I juxtaposed in priceless items or items that actually can't be you know, sold or bought, uh, intangible ideas. So blowout sale on naps, half price on aha moments, jokes, only $88, perfect storm, buy now, buy one, get one, uh-ohs. Um, so yeah, again, more figures of speech being played with. This is a fun book to write. Two for 50 cents, wit, half off apologies, 7.99 per pound, tough luck. 
you kind of get the idea. And then I decided to use color, which I don't often do. And um, I think also maybe that was in response to COVID, just everyone being isolated and quarantining. And I was also thinking about how like my life is now, you know, my immediate family and Zoom, I don't see anyone else. So communication was in these odd platforms where, you know, it's better to say less. So I was thinking about um, what we think and present in the public to what we actually think or what we say in public to what we actually think. And being a Midwesterner, I'm, I was taught to like, you know, be polite, um, sort of in my nature. So I, what I did was the format of this book is the red is a speech bubble, which is what was said. And the blue is a thought bubble, which was an internal private thought. So whatever you want is all right with me, but internally, oh no, oh no, definitely not. Um, I'm just under the weather. And then inside you're like, call for a doctor. Um, third time's a charm. And then internally, we're going down in flames. So it was like a little bit more, I mean, I'm looking at back and it, it feels a little bit more defeatist. I mean, this one isn't, but more snacks, please. And then internally, all the snacks, please. Um, I feel like my outlook on life was a little bleak when I was making this. Some of them are humorous, but some of them are like, now that's just a crying shame. Certainly saw that coming. Or this one, seriously, I'm doing great. Take me into your arms. Uh, and then the, this is the last book I made. I finished it, I think like six weeks or something before the show opened. It's called Hip Hip Hooray. So again, using this like banner uh, signage, but this is a uh, banners, for celebratorial banners um, where you'd normally have a, you know, a happy birthday or congratulations, but instead they're sort of banal um, presenting less than grand events. So false alarm. These are all hand stamped again. Or mediocre achievements I slept in. Which I don't get to do very often anymore with a child. Um, playing with fire sort of suggestions. Tongue tied, which is just ridiculous for a sign to say that. Uh, quenched thirst, plan C. Yeah, so um, all these books are in the show at the center right now. They're all for sale, lots of copies if anybody wants to buy some. And um, big thanks to the center and my fellow scholars. And I'm gonna pass this on to Christina. Stop sharing. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you everyone for coming and thank you Center for Book Arts for the residency opportunity that you gave me and all of us that are speaking tonight. Um, I know I learned so much and we all did and it was beyond wonderful and generous. Um, I'll dive right in and try to be brief. Um, if you've been to the show or you've seen images of it, um, my work in the show is this piece that you see on the screen. It's a sculpture and a wall piece, and I made it at Center for Book Arts and learned how to make it <laughs> at Center for Book Arts. It's made entirely out of book cloth and book board, um, which have been uh, pieced together. So the sculpture is different pieces of book board covered in book cloth, and they slot together. So this can be taken apart and lie perfectly flat. And all of the residents were given a flat file drawer at the Center for Book Arts. And so I manufactured this so that it would fit in um, my flat file drawer and it, it just did. And it's intended to be both a sculpture and also a lectern. Um, so something made out of the materials that a book is made out of, but not a book, but something that you can display and read from a book. Um, I tried to reference in the top part of it, kind of the white as open pages of a book um, to bring it back in to that. And I first made, I first made a bunch of ex little experiments and then I had made this piece, which each, uh, each shape is individually cut out, um, covered and then laid together. And I took so many classes at Center for Book Arts. It was so wonderful. And in the hardcover class, I learned how to cover bookboard. And I just loved the vibrancy of the colors. 
um, and the potential for it. So I spent a lot of time working on that sculpture and experimenting with that and also taking classes. Um, I also made other kind of, uh, I made other small books during the classes or mock-ups for different things. Um, this is a mock-up for a book that I made um, and I used calligraphy in it, which I had learned in a calligraphy class at Center for Book Arts. Um, so, uh, although I am clearly not an expert yet, <laughs> um, but I have been doing a lot of work with the poems of Emily Dickinson, um, where, and also uh, language. So I had translated, um, I was finding different ways to translate the poems of Emily Dickinson into syllable count. Um, so for this book, I uh, made each square of color um, a syllable. So the black square is one syllable, black and red is two, black, red, and blue is three. So for like the word syllable, it has three squares, black, red, and yellow. And I wanted to see if in book form, if you could get the rhythm of her poetry by flipping through without even necessarily reading it. Um, so I accompanied it. I then made it into a digitally printed book that was just very simply bound um, to be distributed at printed matter um, in larger copies. So uh, I'll just quickly read through the poem. Could mortal lip divine the undeveloped freight of a delivered syllable, it would crumble with the weight. Um, and this is just a drawing that I made to give context to that work, which took 50 poems by Emily Dickinson and translated them into their syllables. So what you're looking at is 50 of her poems and, and you can kind of begin to see kind of the musicality and the patterns. And also I became a little obsessed with searching for patterns, um, wondering if I would be able to learn something new about her poetry by focusing completely on, on the syllables and also how things um, get lost in translation and how maybe this could be the purest form of translation um, that is, can exist regardless of language. While at Center of Book Arts, I also participated in um, the New York Art Book Fair. And so I was working on this book um, called No Thank You, where I translated this monologue, the No Thank You monologue from the play Cyrano de Borjac into um, a drawn version of semaphore signaling. So each circle filled in indicates um, uh, each square has two filled in parts of the circle and it indicates the position of the arms as they would be flag signaling. And I show this to also show how uh, I use Center for Book Arts and the space and the tables to um, collate <laughs> and, uh, and the paper cutter and all of these resources were incredibly valuable. Um, I also learned that it's a very bad idea not to put page numbers on a very abstract book like this. <laughs> uh, it can drive you very crazy. Also at Center for Book Arts, I worked on a couple just pretty simple accordion books um, that were playing with the idea, kind of playing off of Saul Lewitt's permutation books, um, taking a line in one direction, then the other direction, then across, then vertically, then horizontally, and then overlaying each of the permutations. Um, and they had sort of these tipped in covers. This is, oops, this is a interior. And this accordion book, Smooth Pursuit, which followed um, a red line across the page, and that one was based on my experience a couple years ago having a concussion, and they 
uh, they test your the movement of your eye, um, and it's called they test your smooth pursuit and whether you can you can follow um, without jumping a line across. But I also thought it was very much like Saul Lewitt and also like David Hockney swimming pools. Um, this I included just an example of another book that I assembled um, at Center for Book Arts and a bit about uh, to show kind of my other work, which is geometric and abstract. Um, this is a table, my table at the New York Art Book Fair in the zine tent, um, which I participated at while I was at Center for Book Arts. So uh, most everything on this table, I assembled copies of at Center for Book Arts. Um, and the thank you cards in the corner I made during a letterpress class and my business card I made during a letterpress class. After Center for Book Arts, I attended a residency at Vermont Studio Center and I continued to play around with um, uh, covering book board and book cloth. And this is a Morse code sculpture. And, um, and then not long after that, COVID happened. And so during that time, up until now, I've been working on textile pieces mostly and drawings. And these are all rug tufted pieces and they aren't books, <laughs> but um, this is a six foot rug that you uh, stand on either end of to keep your distance. And uh, it spells in a code within it, it says plague on either side. So you can read plague abstractly, um, depending on what side you stand on. And then I made this, it was me when I was all isolated <laughs> and, and worried for my health and everyone's, as I still am. <laughs> um, and now I'm getting ready for the virtual New York Art Book Fair, which is February 24th through 28th. It's online and everyone should check it out. There are over 400 exhibitors. And for that one, I am working on a photography book which is made up of photos that I took during the past like two and a half years when I've been installing windows at Saks Fifth Avenue just on the install crew. And I, I've been taking these, uh, these photographs out, out the window. There's kind of a blackout screen so I can, we can all see out but people can't really see in. Um, so it's kind of based off of uh, just the tradition of street photography and a little bit of Walker Evans book, um, Many Are Called, where he took uh, photos on the subway of people unbeknownst to them. So I'm working on that book and a few others for that. Um, and yeah. And that's it. Um, now I will bring it back to, oops, sorry. I will bring it back to Jenna and everyone. And now is the question and answer period. So um, ask away, I guess, for everyone. Back. Okay, so um, I'm gonna bring everyone back to the virtual stage. And um, if people wanna ask their questions in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, I'm also gonna allow participants to unmute themselves if they wanna ask a question over the microphone as well. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions? And maybe some of the artists wanna ask, but I think Ronnie wants to ask. I have a question. question. Um, Christina, I'm curious uh, when you started kind of coding or you know what I mean? <laughs> Can't hear you, you're muted. Okay, good, <laughs> then you didn't hear me curse. <laughs> um, um, I started coding, I don't know, it was maybe working with code maybe two or three years ago, it was, um, it happened around that the time that I got a concussion and I was thinking a lot about um, 
of, of delays in communication and what communication is and communicating across distances. And I had also experienced a, a loss in my family and I was thinking about um, being cut off from communication and ways that like ways of communicating through memories and it sort of, it began, all of that led me to semaphore flag signaling, mm -hmm. um, which where you can communicate uh, across distances mm -hmm. and visually. And um, so I, that sort of then uh, kind of led into a lot of work kind of dealing with translating things into semaphore and then different forms of it and then into syllables and, mm -hmm. and morphs and then just being interested in, in language in general, codes of all kinds. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a question in the chat from Deirdre Lawrence. Um, and this is a question for everyone. Have you felt more productive during these COVID times? Hard to tell if the isolation has made you feel more creative. So if anyone wants to jump in to answer that, go ahead. Please. I, I would just say that um, I, when COVID first hit, there was a extreme sense of urgency for productivity. I think it was my therapy. It was my like crutch. I, I just remember working through the night because there's so much uncertainty surrounding me, at least my practice, I could control. It was the one thing that I could move forward with, uh, you know, by myself. So I, I think I was very productive actually during COVID, um, just as a means of survival. I, on the other hand, I don't think that I have been as productive as I would have wanted to be. I think it took me a long time in the beginning when things were so bad um, to know what kind of work would make sense in such a sad time. And then, of course, when you're when you're not making all the time, you kind of get out of rhythm. So sometimes I look back at work that I was making right before all this. And I'm like, oh yeah, I was really into that idea. I need to get back to it. So I did I did make a lot of work, I think, um, but I didn't feel productive. I'm curious how you felt. I, I guess I, I was productive during during lockdown. <clears throat> I don't know if that's that was more than what I would do usually, but as soon as I uh, got myself a bicycle, I was biking to the Center for Book Arts from middle of May to, you know, through the lockdown, being very careful and very worried. But I, I had opportunity to, to work here in my kitchen, living room, artist studio, but also uh, being on a on a on a uh, on a bicycle um, down the river and in the studio was also very healthy for me. So I guess I was productive, slightly bit more than before. Yeah, I would say for me, it didn't feel entirely productive. I felt uh, like there were a few lost months there just a processing, but um, I think uh, with the passage of time, like just having seen everything not operating as normal, that will, that will, uh, that will feed into something useful for me, I hope. I, yeah, I kept working, but there was a lot of stress and anxiety along with that, so. It didn't feel like a wonderful release at all for me. Can I add something else? Um, Keith was very generous to borrow me his press, to lend me his press um, uh, in August and July. So I had his etching press at home. And I think that was the, probably the, the best part of, my, of, of the summer last year. Thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have a question from Leanne Fong. To what extent have you all become more introspective during quarantine? 
Has it hurt or emboldened your process? Well, that's a good question. Hi, Leanne, thanks for asking such a good question. Um, I think for me, uh, as I mentioned in a, in a short biography, I came from uh, Yugoslavia and I experienced uh, not really a pandemic, but really harsh situation that I think it made me who I am. Uh, so pandemic didn't really change much for me. I, I there was unfortunately, I don't know if that's gonna be wrong to say, but there was like a part of me always thinking the pandemic might happen, um, which, which is something that just happened pretty much overnight back in Yugoslavia. So um, I think the introspective part was always present to me. I was just waiting for others to, to, to get on the same page. Yeah, I think for me, as someone who's a bit introverted and when spends plenty of time in their own head, um, it made me appreciate normal social interactions in a way that maybe I enjoyed complaining about beforehand. So yeah, introspective, maybe it was a chance to be continuously introspective, but um, I'd say for me, it sort of pushed me into the direction of appreciating sociability. Yeah, I think that I've done a lot of um, thinking and I think that uh, I think that in the dormant times and the introspective times, I think that always comes out somehow at some point. So I think the quiet times are also are also count as work. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's definitely been a lot to think about. Um, I would say I, uh, sort of my, maybe my truer feelings about the situation came out in my art as opposed to in what I was doing or conversations I was having, just sort of giving the presence of control. But then I think in my work, I let, I let that sort of be free, like a free fall, like, I also have a photo practice and a photo studio that I maintain. And a lot of the images I was making were about like being confined and tied. I was using a lot of ropes and chains and, you know, just maybe even unbeknownst to me. I mean, I was obviously realized what I was doing, but it just was an automatic that these sort of constraining visuals were coming into my work and all the text-based work that I was making was a right turn to something negative. <laughs> like, I think I just couldn't like not project these kind of feelings that I, you know, more internal. So I just maybe it was more therapy or something, but um, I don't think it um, hurt my practice at all. And maybe just was more freeing, I suppose. Sorry. So I was wondering if any of the artists had questions for each other. Feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, Jennifer, do you think that you're going to keep, it feels like the books that you were making um, at home are also kind of a part of a series. Um, do you, are you gonna continue to make more in that series? Yeah, I sort of, as just a, an easy stipulation for myself when quarantine hit, I bought like 25, large packs of the same paper and I was like I'm gonna make books until this runs out just like on autopilot and I have one pack left so I think I'll probably buy another batch it's, it's just sort of good to keep you know like set up these parameters for yourself where like you, you agree to something um, personally and then you execute it it, it leaves you uh, with a commitment um, so I'll probably continue with the books I do feel like once I started the failed high fives book took me a very long time to make for something I for some reason, uh, I was apprehensive about all the design and the gestures, what to choose. And then after that book was completed, things really got rolling. I don't know, maybe I just felt more um, confident in the ideas I was doing and the, 
the stamping and like the actual process and being okay with it being imperfect because the letterpress book was so pristine and you know crisp and precise and so going to hand stamping you have to like completely lose control um in a way so once that was i was over that i think the practice really did you know take off so i think i will continue it yeah sorry did i answer your question i got on a tangent okay um I wanted to ask for all of you that collaborate, because I do not collaborate, um, how that has changed for you during quarantine. I mean, the parameters must be so different now. Yeah, I think um, things are a little more distanced for sure, but um, it's, still, it's still just as possible to have a back and forth with a collaborator. Yeah. Um, with uh, rapid communication, we can we can make it work. Oh, and Karina, I see your question. That collaboration is here in my studio, and I've added to it. There's a bit more that I want to do um, before I ship it out to California to Linda. Um, Linda Zepong, a former resident and I started a sort of an unbound book together, which is all image at this point, but we'll have some text, which is uh, all about psilocybin. So stay tuned for that one. Does anyone have any other questions? any of the artists or the audience, if anyone in the audience wants to unmute themselves to ask a question, now's your chance. Um, Jenna, I just wanna say how wonderful it was to have all of you as residents. Um, you were really my first batch of residents at CBA. And so I think I'm going to yeah, just hold you in my heart for a long time. And it's been wonderful to see you all grow and to get to know you better and to see all of the collaborations that have spun out of this residency and um, Christina to see your publishing practice growing and um, Slavko, it's been so wonderful to see you throughout the pandemic because he's in the studio all the time and Jennifer to see how much your life has changed and how there's such a consistent thread through your work, even through all of these changes and um, It's just been such an honor to have you all um, at CBA. So I just wanted to say thank you for just being so wonderful as community members, but also um, yeah, thank you for experimenting and trying new things and, and participating. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to say, um, for those of us in the community, I don't know if you know it, but we never want you guys to leave. <laughs> okay, we, we really want you to stay with us. So I want you to think about that. Okay, because it's very hard for us when you guys leave. So just don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, Ronnie. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. I'm holding on to my flat file drawer as long as I possibly can. Great. So on that note, um, yeah, just want to thank the artists and um, all their hard work over the years. and. Um, I highly encourage everyone to check out the exhibition. It includes their work as well as the workspace residents. Um, if you're not able to make it, we will have photos of the installation online in the coming weeks. Um, so yeah, thank you. Can we give the residents a round of applause? You guys can clap on camera, unmute yourself. <laughs> <and clap. laughs> All right, so that concludes this evening's program. I highly recommend everyone to attend our artist talk next week with the workspace residents. Um, you can go to centerforbookarts.org slash events um, to RSVP for that. And yeah, if you guys have any questions or any last things to say, 
feel free to say them now as we all log off and go about our evening. Thank you. We're waving to no one. <laughs>